This is the Mentoring Moments Podcast with Jensen Franklin and Marcus Meekum. Welcome to Mentoring Moments. I'm Marcus Meekum here with Pastor Jensen Franklin, and we have a special guest today. We're so excited about Dr. Fleming, and she's going to talk with us a little bit about mental health. She's a licensed psychologist, a consultant, executive coach. Um, she focuses primarily on pastors, Christian businesses, corporations, leadership development, on and on. She's married yeah. for uh, 18 years, two children, and she is going to be such a blessing to you over these next few minutes. So uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank Pastor, you. you want to talk to us a little bit about how you guys Absolutely. know each other? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, many of you have heard us talk about uh, different things on this podcast, that uh, challenges that we faced in ministry, in our own lives, in our own families. And um, uh, Dr. Michelle Fleming was uh, a person that I believe was put in our lives uh, by the Lord because we were in desperate need mm -hmm. of help and still are in many ways. But... Um, D you know, during COVID, um, life hit hard. So many mm -hmm. people, so many families. And uh, I began to hit situations in our own family that um, I didn't have the answers for, didn't mm -hmm. know where to turn, didn't know what to do. We had uh, a, uh, family in crisis, and, uh, and especially in the area of mental health. And... Uh, we went to uh, John Townsend. I'm, I'm yep. still trying to remember. That's how we were introduced. Yeah. Yeah. How did I? How did I meet him? And how did all that happen? And I'm uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'm sure Sharice would know exactly. But we went to him, and he then realized, you know, that we were mostly in Georgia. Mm -hmm. He lives out on the West Coast, and of course, he wrote the book, co-wrote the book with uh, Dr. Cloud. Yeah. Right. Henry Cloud. Um, Boundaries. Right. And he immediately told us that he highly recommended you uh, on the East Coast for because you were in it based out of Atlanta. And uh, the things that she has done for Sharice and I and our family in, in helping us, um, I had no idea the impact that and the good that could come out of having somebody you can turn to in ministry and, and in life and... Uh, they're expert at giving you step-by-step -step structure and process of bringing your life back together after it's kind of uh, imploded. Yeah. And that, that's what you meant to us. And so Thank you. Um, we were talking, my wife and I, Sharice, and she loves you so much. And she wanted you to, uh, she wanted you to get your message out there because mm -hmm. her heart is really for pastor's wives mm -hmm. uh, that feel so isolated, so alone, so um, in, a, in a glass house. And you are supposed to have a perfect everything, perfect mother, perfect family, That's perfect marriage, yeah. perfect kids, and and all of it. So with all of that said, mm -hmm. thank you for who you are, what you do, and uh, we're delighted you're here. Why don't you start sure. off by telling us a little bit about your own journey into uh, the place where you are today in mental health and helping so many sure, people. Sure, I will. And let me also say, um, in working with you, Pastor, and your family, I found you so open and just you know open to understanding and open to um, learning new ways. And that is just the key mm. for making progress with any sort of counselor or when you're getting mentorship is just that teachable open heart. So um, that makes a big difference. Thank yeah. you. And and uh, people like me love to work with people that are open and non-defensive in that way. Well, I think too your qualifications, just quite frankly, you know, mm -hmm. I think I think someone who is a pastor, and especially if they've you know had some level of success at if, at, at doing what they're trying to do, if they're going to submit and listen to someone, number one, it meant to me, I need to know that you have a Christian uh, worldview right. and uh, come from biblical foundations and counseling. That was critical to me. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was I needed to know that this person is highly recommended by someone I respect and someone who knows you and your life. And, you know, that was Dr. Townsend in this case, which meant a lot because that's a big deal. You don't know where to turn as, yeah. in ministry. I honestly, 
I, I couldn't go. I, I talked to him on a personal level about just about anything. Uh, but other than that, you know, you, you, you're just talking with colleagues and stuff. And so, and, and the last thing though, that I would say that made, made me feel peace about uh, bringing my family to you was your qualifications. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your call, your qualifications. I think it makes people pay attention more, sure, quite frankly. Sure. Absolutely. So I started out, uh, in my career life in sales for a high tech firm, doing a lot of traveling and having tons of people reporting to me all across North and South America and had that feeling, well, burnout, I guess we would describe it now, of like there's got to be more than this. I feel like I'm meant for more than this. And I'd always been interested in the field of psychology. But what I discovered is that you could actually go and get training that was integrated with a Christian worldview. So at the time I was in Southern California and Biola University is training Christian therapists. There's several others that are out there also doing it. And I realized I can actually integrate my faith into my daily job and what I want to do. So I went on to get a master's and a PhD at Biola. And that is where, through a colleague, I met Dr. John Townsend and then started working with his area because I had been in uh, business. I'd worked for the church for a time when I was a young adult. I, it was a good match and that he had his... his uh, <laughs> Dissertation professor was my dissertation professor, so that part was uh, kind of fun knowing that that he had studied under the same way and studied the same research and attachment and and ego psychology and just the things that we need to kind of strengthen us and get us through these difficult times. So I worked with John for several years there in California. He has uh, conferences along with uh, Henry Cloud called Ultimate Leadership, where you can fly into California and work with them for a week at a time. It's very like an intensive, one week intensive for pastors. Uh, and for wow. Christian business owners, also for other counselors, Christian counselors. And he needed folks to come in and help run groups there. So I did that for him for many years before relocating back here to the South, which is where I'm from. So I uh, met my Southern California born and bred husband and drug him back here. So that, that was quite a four-year negotiation in our marriage, but made it back here and then started private practice of just, uh, again, kind of working with the same demographic in the heart for really um, impacting leaders. Because when you impact the leader, then he sets the culture for everything else that's happening. Very good. That's absolutely happened. His getting into counseling got me into counseling, oh, got my wow. children into counseling. <laughs> oh, wow. It has been really helpful. Well, there's yeah. really so a... So it is, it is, when it comes, it does, the leadership, it does kind of, okay, maybe if he's doing, I, I should probably be thinking about this too, because I'm more messed up than he is. So. <laughs> but, but you, yeah, no, it's not, no. But, but, but you know, um, it, there is a stigma uh, sort of uh, to in in ministry uh, that you're supposed to have it all together in every area all the time, and I also think that there's uh, a, a misconception that there's nothing wrong with not waiting until you're in a crisis to um, have somebody that you can go to to discuss the heaviness of life or just how are you doing. Because we don't really check up on each other, we we are, we we have the metal to the pedal, or vice versa, whatever it is, and and we're going. You know, it's 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 Christmas is coming up, and Thanksgiving yeah. is coming up, and there's this, there's that, and so when do we ever stop and recharge our batteries, and how do we do that? And so maybe, uh, and it doesn't require you being in a in a burnout, stressed out, messed up place to need help. Uh, or even have a, I, I, I really see it as accountability mm -hmm. in my marriage, in yeah. my family. I'm, I'm being accountable to somebody who would tell me not what I want to hear. I have a lot of people that might would say that. I hope I'd, I really try to surround myself with people who will push back on me because I think that's important because mm -hmm. like, we get stupid. We get, <laughs> so we get arrogant. We get uh, disillusioned, you know, and if we don't watch it. And it's good to have somebody that you know, I got to go, my wife and I are going to this person and she's going to spill all the beans <laughs> of anything that I'm not doing that is not uh, honoring or yep. uh, really what I would call being a Christian leader, right? Our spouses do that for each other, don't they? Yes, they do. Do you do so, that for us, I mean. <laughs> so, so how do you, let's, let's just start, just delve in here. Sure. Like, um, how do you recognize uh 
uh, signs that maybe you need, you should be getting some help? And, and how does that process start? Yeah, great question. So I believe all of us have an in- intuition that know when something's a little off. So the signs would be kind of what we say, everything inside of our skin, that we know we're feeling really anxious, even if other people can't see it, or uh, really revved up, um, kind of running thoughts, can't can't sleep well at night, nervousness feeling, that would be kind of what anxiety, some things that anxiety feels. Or we know that we are just slogging through it. I mean, we're just fatigued and down, doesn't matter how much caffeine or how much sleep you get. And you've just kind of lost the enjoyment that you used to get out of doing ministry or or even, you know, time with your family, like you're having a hard time finding joy in the things that you do. Again, you might have the mask on, no one else can tell. So that would be one sign kind of checking in. The other sign could be other people coming to us saying, hey, I'm noticing dot, dot, dot. You know, we see that you're not doing as well, or I can tell you're kind of down and just being open to that feedback that other people are noticing. And then the final place I'd say probably leaks out would be like in our behaviors. If you have behaviors that you know are not health, healthy, you know they're becoming destructive, but you can't stop them. Like, well, I'll know up here what to do. It's the actual application of how to change. That's the challenging part. That's what you know. people like me specialize in. How do I actually apply it to my specific situation? Uh, so I would look for those sort of indicators, kind of the personal, uh, the relational people around us and behaviors. And, and feel free, Marcus, to jump in. But what are the what are the um, what are the top things that you see in in pastors and leaders uh, now that that you would say are flashing red lights on the dash? Uh, yeah, uh, warning signs, basically. And, and there's there's uh, a, a lot of pastors out there who are having those flashing warning signs. Uh, so number one challenge, I would say, is isolation. Mm. Yeah, that they're the pastor everywhere, right? They're the pastor and not the person. That's really good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the person might be worried or fearful, but the pastor can't show that, right? And the person might be struggling in their relationship with their marriage or have a child that's struggling, uh, but the pastor can't say that. Wow. So they get isolated, um, and mm-hmm. then the second one would be the tremendous amount of expectation that can be put on a pastor from the congregation, and and maybe even from staff, really where good. they have to they they have to be perfect. You know, some pastors, well, we all I, I like to call it high levels of excellence. Some people call it perfectionism, but we all have a little bit of that, right? To do well at what you're doing, but when you get that from other people that you have to be perfect then, you know, any sort of, I said this wrong or did this wrong or this person was upset. And now with social media, it gets amplified. So you put those two things, the isolation with the like focused attention on any imperfection, and that's kind of the perfect storm. That's so true. What you just said, social media, um, it, it, it in so many ways is like, magnifies uh, everything about, especially in ministry, if you have haters, if you have mm-hmm. people who just, they can ju- they can take the cheap shots at you, at your kids, at your family, at your uh, everything about you, and they can stay hidden in the shadows. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tough, tough world. Um, Sharice and I were talking with a pastor's wife just recently, just in like the last week or so. And she just opened up this pastor's wife and she just said that there's just certain people in the congregation who feel like they're just able to say whatever they want to mm-hmm. say about anything that that concerning her 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 family, her mm-hmm. children, or and and she's trying to walk that tight rope of, you know, you really have no right, but they are kind of old school and kind of older people in the church that feel like they have a right to just kind of say whatever they want to say. How do you build boundaries around your family and ministry or in in, in, in leadership to where there is sacred, holy ground that um, I will I will fiercely defend my family. My family is my family, and uh, I will I will defend my family. Over the yeah, this is this is very hard for me to say because I love the church, 
but I love my family, and I, I believe the call of God and the church is part of that. Mm-hmm. But I don't think people have a right to cross certain lines because I'm just like them. I, I, I'm a human being, and I, I have struggles. We have struggles, too. Yeah. Yeah, so building that boundary is basically that protection space around them. Uh, and because they do get drugged through both that isolation and all eyes on them with you. Uh, so certainly one boundary would be protecting family time in general, making sure that you have time as a family that's away mm. from the church and church activities. Break that down a little bit. So what mm. what do you think? Because this is a real issue with pastors yeah. that they just feel like, especially, you know, I'm blessed now that I have an amazing staff that can just, but it took me years and years and years. And they know when I'm having a hard week. They know, that my, the, you know, the inside track. They know when I just, I just need to f- focus on whatever. But I remember the years when I did not have that. And I care, and, and the, and the, the wheels keep turning. I mean, yeah. Sunday keeps yeah. coming. Issues keep coming. And I know there are listeners right now that are right there, and they don't have the luxury of having uh, a staff and and like that, you know, to that degree, or even relationships with the staff like that to that degree. So um, I don't know if I'm making sense. I know I'm real scattered, but I, I, I'm really trying to put myself back in in 20 years ago. Uh, ten sure. years ago, even that that I was so in need of help, but I couldn't reach out. And how do you start building those boundaries, even of time with your family? Well, one of the first boundaries would be in the in your mind, so that when you're with your family, you shut a mental door on everything that's going on with the church. Because mm-hmm. I think we've all probably experienced somebody being there but not there. You know, being there physically, but the mind is. Yeah, so that would be kind of one boundary around the mind. In terms of like setting the boundary both with the family and the congregation, reminds me uh, when we first moved to California, we were looking for a church. We went to a small uh, non-denominational church, and the pastor was um, showing on the screen a letter that his seven-year-old daughter had written that basically said, Daddy, we miss you because you're never home. Wow. And he said, we are now officially canceling Saturday night services because wow. I have to be, I have to have 24 hours where I am at home with my mm-hmm. kids. And I thought, this is where I'm going. This, this is the church I want to attend. Like I can follow I can follow someone like That's that. That's so good. Yeah, that spirit of leadership that in the turn, home. Now, listen, think of that, that quality person sitting out, family sitting out there. And it wasn't the man's strength that made you want to follow him. It yeah. was his vulnerability and weakness that you could relate to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, and later, as we were attending, in passing, giving a message, he said, and my therapist said, and then just keep just kept talking. <laughs> and it wasn't about his therapist. I was like, that is so amazing. Again, it's imagine really what that does to just lower the stigma. Mm. I'm imperfect. You guys are imperfect. You're not here worshiping me. We're worshiping Jesus together in some <laughs> aspect, right? Whoa. And obviously, was open to, to therapy. That was before I was a therapist. I was still in training. So, yeah, that is one way. You just show people the vulnerability and the why, and you set the boundary. Very and good, huh? and they can handle it. The congregation can handle it. It's also not fragilizing the congregation. Like, I, I have to be all things to all people. I have to keep everyone happy. That's that pressure that the pastors are under. And kind of just stepping through that, saying, I can be authentic and be myself and show the stress lines a little. This is a stress line happening in my family, and I got to, at times, prioritize them. So yeah. good. I know one of the, and what you're saying for me personally, one of the things I found out when I went to counseling was I guess I'm a codependent. You know, I guess a lot of people that go into our type of work are. Sure. Yep. And um, I didn't understand that, that was a, that's actually a, a, a negative. And that's mm. what ends up messing us up a lot is we go in to help people. Because somehow we're trying to resolve uh, an incomplete, you know, issue from maybe our childhood or whatever, and we're trying to, you know, finish the story loop, if you will. Yeah. And um, and so you know, when you start getting into it, you realize like how you think that if you're not the hero, that everything falls apart. That if right. you're not the strong one, if you're not the one with, ang- and almost like you're trying to protect everybody 
from the fact that you're just a, a person. Like you're just a normal person that that can't always be up, that can't always be strong, that can't always be happy, right. that can't always, you know, and and it's, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're fatigued, you want to quit, you want to give up, but you can't really tell people that kind of stuff. But to kind of hear what you guys are saying and what I've started to learn is, you know, whether it's my family or my kids or, or even the church and in a way that is appropriate, you know, you have to say, hey, I'm not Superman at all. And um, so what would you say, you know, because I think the challenge for me was I thought that biblically, I thought hmm. that mental health and all those kind of things, like if I'm spiritually right, if I just fast, if I just pray, if I just, you know, then these issues, these other issues will work out but they didn't, they didn't work out. No matter how, I prayed more, fasted more. And I'd go back to the same prayer place and say, God, I, you not fix that. You're not fixing that. Yeah. What else am I supposed to do? How, how I've read the book on this and I've read the, this mm-hmm. on that. And I've gone to listen to this podcast or this teaching or this series or study this person that's the expert. And I did everything they said. It's mm-hmm. not fixing whatever it is. It's broken, broken. So I, you know, maybe help pastors like me out there that struggle to see why is it so important that we that we have somebody that we're going to if we don't? How do we find that person? Where do we find someone like you? I know you're yeah. busy, so a lot of people can be like, "Hey, how do we get sure <laughs> sure information?" You're going to say, "Well, I yeah. can't." Um, but I don't know. Help us, like, because to find that person is so hard. So hard, yeah. And I, as we were talking beforehand, I want to offer definitely resources. I'm going to have a free ebook on my website Good. that you can download uh, at Dr. Michelle Fleming, Dr. Michelle Fleming, one L and Michelle, one M and Fleming, and that'll be a list of resources of everything we talk about on this podcast, but also how to find Christian counselors and all the different organizations out there that have Christian counselors and resources for pastors. Um, so. The question, first I want to affirm, yes, of course, prayer and fasting does help, right? And reading scripture and living a life of virtue, all of those things do help. But is that sign right there that you said is, I'm doing all these things and it's not getting better, right? There's a blind spot. There's something I can't figure out. Um, that's what got me interested in counseling and in my own counseling um, journey is that I just, it wasn't working out the way I had thought and everything. I actually, for me, it was around uh, kind of dating and finding a marriage partner. Uh, and I had a whole list of all the books and I was going to the singles group at the church and I started a singles group at the church and the whole thing. And it just, it wasn't working. It wasn't working. I read the book Boundaries and Dating uh, by Cloud and, Cloud and Townsend and realized like, okay, I can take this and bring this into my personal life and find someone that how the book talks about how do I apply it to my personal life, my specific appli- my specific environment, but what I bring to it. So let's say in the book, it can tell you, hey, you know, um, do this certain thing or, or say this certain thing. But if I'm really anxious and say it in an anxious way, that's going to come off a certain way. If I'm defensive, that's going to come off a certain way. Well, who in my life is going to tell me I'm doing that, this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where I'm keeping myself isolated. That's where in that alone in the room, you can get that feedback. You can get that kind of outside opinion, also from a Christian worldview of where you're tripping yourself up, you know, where you're kind of getting in your own way. So I would say what um, counseling and good mentorship brings is the tools of how to do it. Uh, When you go to the Bible, that's the who and the why. And when you go to counseling, that's like the how. <laughs> and it just like, you know, 200 years ago, we didn't know how to treat cancer. You certainly wouldn't only try to pray cancer away. You would probably still go get your tests done and talk to a medical professional. And the field of, you know, medical diagnosis has improved. Well, that's what's happened in the past 200 years. We understand more how the mind works and we can understand how to treat the mind um, we can understand what's happening in the feelings and what helps resolve anger and unforgiveness and resent, resentment and trauma and healing from sins that happened to us that, that might have nothing That's to good. do with our own behaviors. It's very good. Even yeah. even grief of losing Absolutely. a child or, um, you know, is uh, does the Bible address mental health? Is it, is it in the scriptures that um, what we're, how do you marry the two? 
of uh, the world of psychology and, and human behavior and the Word of God? Yeah, great question. So being made in the image and likeness of God, and we are His creation, by the study of who we are and how He designed us, that is the study of God. That is learning. So for instance, He has designed us for attachment. I'm sure as you may have heard the studies, you can feed a baby and keep a baby warm. And if you don't hold and attach that baby, the baby will die. They were having babies dying in orphanages in other um, parts of the world just because they were so busy, they weren't held. Mm. So you actually are made and driven for uh, attachment. So those sort of things like understanding that that God clearly made us for attachment for himself. Uh, the verse, um, uh, the greatest commandment comes to mind is, you know, to love your Lord, your God with your heart, your mind, and your soul. Wow. So the soul is there, right? The mind is going to be hard to love God if our mind is running with these anxious thoughts, right? And how do you praise the Lord when you're, you can't stop crying, you know, because your heart is broken. So um, I, I see psychology is not there to replace you know, the Bible or Jesus' word is there to support you in that, in a way, our mental health is almost a way of witnessing to the Lord. You know, if he tells us love is patient and kind, I am not patient and kind all the time. I need to learn how to be patient and kind. As Christians, if we're going to be different, that's how people are going to see us be different, right? You know, I might have the fish sticker on my car, but when I go to work, am I that patient, kind, gentle you know, not self-centered person. Am I living that out? And when I can't, I can go to someone to talk talk through like, how can I how can I deal with these struggles and how can I deal with this difficult person potentially in my life? I love that about the mind and the heart. Love him with all of your mind. How how do you love God with your mind and your and I love what you said about broken hearts because there are so many people whose hearts have been broken. And sooner or later, life does not turn out like you thought it would. Would, And so um, can we take a deeper uh, dive into that? Like mm-hmm. how, do you, uh, how do you restore or renew your mind? What, what can you do if you've been through something, you feel burnout, you feel used up, you feel weary, you feel frustrated and heartbroken, um, how do you recover from that? Yeah. So the field of psychology approaches um, the mind in two different ways. Some believe that your thoughts create your feelings. And some believe that your feelings create your thoughts. It's probably a little bit of both. Um, from the angle that I'm trained in practice in, it's very strong uh, emphasis on like our attachments and our relationships. And so healing uh, normally is... In our, we're normally injured within a relationship, and so many times healing needs to come from a relationship, right? So it's us and God, but it's also kind of horizontal. Um, so that now I don't want to scare people off, but some people say that all therapy is grief therapy because mm. there is the losses yeah, that we're working that through. Makes sense. Yeah, it's a loss of uh, how I thought things were going to turn out, um, what I thought I could control right? Um, what I thought I was doing right. Um, it just, uh, the necessary losses we go through in life, um, simply getting older, there's a loss there. And so we have all these defenses against loss, which are all those other feelings, you know, the anger, the resentment. Um, it, sometimes anxiety is like the energy it takes to hold down other feelings we don't want to have. Uh, grief hurts. It, it hurts physically, it hurts emotionally, actually can show up physically in our bodies in all sorts of ways. So of course we defend against it. So um, taking the opportunity to kind of peel those layers and letting that emotion come out is where you get the restoration. And sometimes grief, you have to almost do a 360 on grief is what I like to call it. Uh, so because there's so many different angles, there's layers and layers and um, it's, it's not a one-time thing. Right, mm-hmm. the healing is not, as Dr. Townsend likes to say, healing is not a microwave. If it's an oven, and we live in this microwave society, um, so it would the the healing comes from kind of the deep dive into what's happening in our hearts and being able to bring that to the Lord and someone so, else. So, um, I'm I'm 61 years old, and I st- I think we started coming to you maybe two years ago. Yeah, about yeah. So I was 59, I guess. <laughs> And never been to a counselor. Um, been to we had a, a older minister 
uh, Bishop T.F. Tenney, who would speak to me and Sharice when we were really having struggles, mm-hmm. and he and his wife. And they would, he was so straight. He was such a straight shooter with me. It was just wonderful. And when he died, uh, there was a real, for several years, there was a real uh, vacancy in our life to go to people mm-hmm. that we could say anything to and say we're struggling. Uh, Sharice would call her and say, um, you know, we're struggling. Uh, and, and a lot of times, um, it's raising a family too as your family gets older and and you know you you're not in control of their life you're not in control of their decisions you're not in control of the directions and 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 you're so used to being that authority and voice and then you realize they 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 have their own uh, life and it may or may not include, your world and and your church or all of those things. Fortunately, thankfully, all of mine have ultimately landed there. Mm-hmm. But boy, what a journey! Yeah, and and I thank God for my family. I love them all so much. So proud of them all. But I also know that when I started coming to you, when Sharice and I, the the other was more of a a, a spiritual accountability and and wonderful. Uh, sounding board and, and biblical counsel and prayer. But with you, it was different. So I kind of want to build a um, what to expect if somebody mm. goes and reaches out t- to get help. Because I didn't know what to expect. I, w- I, I, I almost had the mentality, I'll do anything to have a better relationship with my wife. Yeah. I don't care what it is. I, I don't care who knows. I don't care. I want help for my family. I can't. The pain is too much, mm-hmm. and it feels like that we're, there's so much going on that we're going. Me and me and my wife, Sharice, are going. And you know, it, it's like if we got together, we would end up in some kind of turmoil. And it was always usually somebody else. You know, their their battles, mm-hmm. and it just stirred us up. So I guess what I'm trying to say is what I what I noticed about when I first went to you. Number one, the first the first time Sharice and I came, I felt hope. I saw mm-hmm. a change in her because it meant something to her massively that I would yep. be willing to come get help. That I genuinely was open and honest in those gatherings and meetings. That it meant it. I didn't. I didn't get all of that when I went. I. I didn't realize what mm. it meant to her, mm-hmm. uh, too. You know, because I needed it, and then I didn't realize how desperate I needed it, <laughs> and I didn't even know I needed it. And I think that's where a lot of people are because you know we we just do this for years and years and years, and I'm not a. I don't. I'm not like a. You know, I always almost saw it as if there must be some kind of weakness or something in a person. Mm-hmm. You know, it sounds so silly now, but those those uh, kinds of mentalities can really develop in your life, and you almost uh, feel like that you, that could never be you. That's that other guy, that other couple, or that other family. But when when we started coming, I, number one, I'd feel better when it, when we come to you. I'd feel better at the end. And we would be closer at the end mm. every time, sometimes very intense uh, discussions and things, that, you know, that were were heart-wrenching and, and hard to say. And um, But we would feel it's amazing the load that would lift, the, the feeling mm. of lighter. I feel lighter. I feel hopeful. Mm-hmm. I feel hopeful. Mm-hmm. I did not have a lot. I, I, I was, I'm always a person of faith, and I know God can do anything. But I would feel lighter and I would feel hopeful. And that is a big deal to somebody struggling and trying to be in ministry and carrying carrying the load of a church and everything else. And then it was like what you what you triggered all that was you said it's like an onion. It's, uh, it's appealing layer by layer. And you did several things that I noticed. You always had seemingly an agenda. Uh, you would even give us things before we would meet again that you ask us both to read and even maybe a short, not, I mean, it would take 10, 10, 10 minutes, the whole stuff, really. If you, But it was enough to focus 
me and for the meeting even. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, and I don't know if I'm making sense, but I noticed that. And I noticed, too, that at the end, you always had a summary and and so that means I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I want you to do this. May, just maybe three things like that. And that's what I think is missing. Like, you can go pray with people, you can go talk to people, but then there's those people like yourself who who know how to take the mess. It's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Bring it down to two or three root causes and and the and the light bulb goes off that you know she's right that is true i do do that you know i do, i am that i i have that you know that is what we're doing if it's in a marriage thing that's causing trouble right mm-hmm. does that make sense i mean yeah. I, I want people to understand the value is not just to be going to a counselor to be going to a counselor to to, to just come in there and and talk but if it's if it's a good one they're going to give you some kind of structure and plan to to work to get better. That's right. And to take what feels like chaos. Absolutely. And boil it down to these are the parts that need to change. You know, as, as we see it as like a whole system. We can see kind of what's causing the chaos and just bring it down to each person's personal responsibility. Because what I love what you said is that I wanted to go and get the help. And I was motivated. And I will encourage people to come when that pain is either more than you want to handle or is just getting in the way of what you want out of life. Uh, You can't come to change the other person. And I really had that sense in working with you, that you were, again, open in there. You were there out of love for your wife and, and for your family. And those are the motivators that get you into therapy and why good therapy happens and happens well. Uh, the second piece to expect when seeing a therapist is somebody that you feel is helpful. Uh, not every therapist matches every person. Yeah, so I would encourage good. people to it's interview a couple therapists. Most therapists will do like a 15 or 20 minute, if you don't have an introduction like we do, like a 15, 20 minute free consultation. Ask them about their qualifications, uh, their Christian world, their worldview, their Christian worldview. If they're not a Christian, how do they feel about you being a Christian? Um, and so make sure that match uh, is there. And I think that's so important because what you 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 always go to the cores of um, of of uh, you don't like the you didn't quote a lot of you don't quote a lot of scriptures, <laughs> but you uh, you. you go to the core of the truth. Everything, the principles that you give are always biblically based. As a preacher, I know that because mm-hmm. I, even though you're not saying it in, um, you Chapter know, like our, our world of saying it, right. the Bible says, <laughs> but but you are laying out uh, principles. Right, yes. Principles yeah. that are rock solid. Of course and that's I, so important. I would not try to tell you what the Bible says. <laughs> so that's true. Um, but drawing from that knowledge along with kind of the study of creation, the study of relationships yes. and what happens when we get anxious about that attachment, why we are withdrawing, you know, why we are attacking and criticizing, uh, putting those pieces together and boiling them down to, you know, I'm asking you to do this. The, the work in that hour is um, kind of like the consultation piece, but the couples that do well are the well, the ones that do the work outside of the therapy room. Yeah, it's not therapy isn't meant to last forever, right? It's meant to practice, learn the tools here, practice them together, and then take them from here. So I would also say, you know, to make sure that when you're going, it feels helpful to go even sometimes when you feel like you don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I like to describe therapy as like a massage for the brain. It's honestly, it's a privilege. It's really We're good. very privileged. The brain is just another um, muscle in your body. And it's like a massage for the brain. You also wouldn't go to the gym and try to build a bicep, you know, going three <laughs> hours for three weeks. That's you're not going to have a bicep. You're going to be sore. So it's the consistency. Mm-hmm. So when you hear people say, oh, yeah, I went to therapy. It didn't work. Well, you know, what, you went six weeks? You know, how long is the gym going to work for you if you go for six weeks, right? It's it's consistency, and then you have a foundation, and you don't, you know, you you don't have to stay in forever. So really, right. it's just seeing I am getting help on another it's really good. part of my physical body and part of my brain, um, and wow. 
Yeah. That's a great concept. <laughs> It's like well, going it to a is. personal trainer, yeah. I guess. Yeah, uh, it I, is, I'm, so. I'm taking up all the time, but but um, I think too, like, so can we? And this is so unfair. I feel like to <laughs> to just do a hypothetical. Sure, but, sure, those are good. But I think, like, okay, let's say you're a pastor and wife, and you got life hitting. Let's say you got a you got stuff going on in the church. <laughs> you got um, you and your wife are, are at stress level and at each other and it's not mm-hmm. going well and the children are, are doing their thing and um, uh, okay so what can we do to help a marriage that's listening right now and it's really bad and they 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 are doing the best they can they love each other they love mm-hmm. God they love their family but they're really really struggling maybe even the enemy is starting to creep in mm-hmm. sure and uh they need help yeah they need help what where where do you start in your mind when somebody comes to you like that mm-hmm. and you understand a preacher's world the pro the public all the things that they have to kind of juggle. Yeah. So how do you how do you see that kind of person that's listening right now? How do you help them? The first thing I would suggest is that they reach out for help, right? Hopefully their church would have some referrals to some good therapists and there's counseling centers at uh, churches, there's counseling centers at Christian universities. So um, and again, I'll list some references in that free ebook. There's a um, American Association of right. Christian Counselors. There's a bunch of different associations. Yep. The Townsend Institute is training uh, counselors. So the first would be ask for help. And when you go get help, what to expect would be listening. That therapist should be able to listen because both of you need to be able to tell your story. Uh, the therapist isn't the referee or the traffic cop, Uh, as I always like to tell my couples, the relationship is my client, the Mm. relationship between the two of you, because I'm here for that. So if you need to be told something or you need to be told something to make that work, that's what we're doing here. I think that is, that's powerful because Sharice, um, she needed to know that I love what you, that the relationship is your, is your customer or client, uh, not, not, one uh, one dominant personality or whatever you know it's and that that is a big deal i think to to pastors wives to know that there's somebody that will say whatever needs to be said and allow it to be said and then and then deal with it yeah and and underneath the things that need to be said is normally this deep longing to be close mm. I always go with the assumption there's a deep longing to be close. If there's if that longing to be close is not there, then that's kind of different work. That's why you come before it gets to the part of crisis, before you start thinking about separating and divorce. If you're thinking that, definitely go run as fast as possible. But it's also there beforehand. Again, you go to the gym before you get sick. Right? You don't want to wait till you get sick to take care of you know your your health. Uh, and so that deep longing to be close is scary. And vulnerable because this person is so important to me. You know, we have tied our horses together, and we are have no other options except for to, to stay together. So, uh, a good therapy will help kind of reduce those fears, or reduce the person that is um, withdrawing just out of that fear, and get underneath and remind the two of you of what it feels like to be close. And that would be the experience: is that. You have it with each other. You can kind of find each other again and remember why you first got married. Mm. Or I like to say, hey, if you got married for the wrong reasons, you can stay together for the right ones. Yeah. Even if you didn't have a honeymoon period, you know, we can you can refind it here. Uh, so you can expect to remember what it feels like to like being around your spouse <laughs> again and really be good. able to have conversations without them, uh, you know, boiling over. This is real controversial, I think, in certain um, w- worlds of Christianity. But are there times when you um, when you need the help of medicine? Oh, great for question! Mental health. Yeah, great question. Uh, again, looking at the brain as just another organ in the body, there are times that the brain itself is breaking down, and we call it like an organic functioning. For instance, schizophrenia is one of those diagnoses that. 
has many times very little to do with the person's environment. It is an organic brain disorder. There's nothing that person did. There's nothing that family did mm. to create that disease in many cases. Uh, bipolar is very similar to that. So yes, there is a time and a place for the application of what we call psychotropic drugs to certain diagnoses. Um, I would suggest definitely working with a psychiatrist who gives out medications and a psychologist at the same time. I don't prescribe psychologists and counselors don't prescribe. And the research shows that the talk therapy in combination with the medical, the uh, psychotropic drugs is the most effective. And so that the drug doesn't just become a Band-Aid that you stay on forever and that it's not kind of handed out you know, too easily. Um, I, one example, my 90-year-old grandmother just became severely depressed and she had never taken anything in her life. I, I tend to, because we don't prescribe, I don't tend to over, like I don't overbelieve right. in that. It, it changed the last few years of her life that for her to get on an antidepressant just really quickly, it was amazing. Sometimes it really works. I know probably what a lot of people see is that some people get stuck for years and they're switching the meds around and there's all these side effects and there can be complications to it. So that's why I would suggest making sure you're also getting good counsel at the same time. It's very good. It's so, so good. At lunch before, before this, Courtney was talking about, because we were just talking about how like for for us, every Monday at one o'clock is our counseling appointment. Well, it's, I, mm. and that's because that's my for sure day off, no matter mm. what. But after Sunday, the last thing I want to do is go do that. And every time, it's like you dread. But it's like going to the gym. I don't. Yep. I work out. I've worked out for most of my heck, since I was a ch child. That's you know I'm I'm, uh, but I don't ever th wake up and say I can't wait to get there. But I know the reward. I know what happens after. I know the endorphins. I know it helps me think lighter about heavy things. I know that piece of it. And Courtney was saying, she asked this question. She says, have you ever um, regretted it after? Hmm. And counseling is that same way. Like you said, it, it gives you hope. It's great. Point. Yeah. It is such a good thing to to force yourself into it because you don't ever want to go. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not sitting here feeling warm and fuzzy. He's like, oh, God. Because he wants to go dig into all this. Really, I love you say that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, but I would have to confess, it. I was the same way sure. every time. But, sure. you know, it's like, I, dr I dread this a little. Yeah. And then I was so glad afterwards. I was so glad. I can honestly say that. And, you know, to get me to sit down for, Sometimes ours much longer than an hour. Yeah. And to get me to do that is not because I'm anything special. It's just I'm, I can't even hardly sit here. Like <laughs> physically, I'm, I feel like I'm about to, I know. Uh, you know, but um, it's, it is, it, there is something to it. Come, let us reason together, the scripture says. And especially when you have the counsel um, that, people like Dr. Fleming bring. I, I love what you said earlier um, about couples, the deep desire to be close. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is the, yearn, the, the yearning in the hearts of many couples listening right now. And even the arguments and stuff, even the, 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 the words spoken sometimes that are not, that are not good, it is really a crying out of "I want to be close to you." If we, I want to be close to you, right? That's right. Yeah, we uh, we call it separation protest. That you are protesting wow. the separation you feel, and wow. for some, it can come across as criticism and nagging and anger. Um, and then for others, it's more of withdrawal and isolation, stonewalling, defensiveness. But underneath that is this cry that. I, I need and want to be close. We don't like that vulnerable feeling. Well, somebody needs to hear that today because it's it's that that's life giving, hope giving too, right? Yeah. I mean, when you yeah. see it, and it's true. I guess the time, in other words, what you're saying is the time to really be concerned is when you don't care anymore. That's the dangerous time. Yes, you don't even care enough to fight or communicate or say yeah. anything that you that you feel. Deeply, And it's interesting you said and not even enough to communicate or fight. So the couples we're most concerned about are the ones that show up in therapy and say, yeah, we don't fight. 
we're just done. We've just both withdrawn. We've gotten into the withdrawn cycle. Mm -hmm. So what happens between couples is um, what Sue Johnson calls this demon dialogue, this cycle Mm -hmm. that, I mean, you could point the finger here or here, but it's just an infinitive loop that there's no one place to stop and teaching you how to step step out of that cycle so we don't get drawn into our fight cycle or our withdrawing cycle, you know, how to restore ourselves after the cycle. And for me, I couldn't do this without the hope. So when I see that happen in in uh, couples, like people say, how do you listen to people's problems all all day? Because yeah. I see hope, I see restoration. Good question. Yeah, I believe, I, uh, if, I hope you have a therapist that believes in the general goodness of who we are as humans. And I believe most people desire to give love and receive love and not have maniacal or, you know, evil intent. And in those cases, um, you see that bond happen, you see families change, you see marriages change, and you feel the sense of the Holy Spirit in the room. You know, it's it's not all. Obviously, what the therapist's doing is the work the couple does, the work that the Holy Spirit comes in and does between us. And uh, that's, yeah, that's the only way. It gives me energy. Uh, um, I think I think of the early days of ministry when I used to I didn't have any staff had a part time secretary and I would sit for hours because people would ask for an appointment and I would sit and do thirty minutes a day with different people over and you know whatever they needed biblical counsel mm-hmm. so back then. You know, the pastor was expected to do all of it. Yeah. And I can I can remember after a day of just nothing but appointment after appointment after appointment of this one's issue and this one and this one and this one, feeling so drained, like I could not hardly stand to go back in the next day and do that again. And and yet, you know, people need a pastor and mm-hmm. they need somebody to talk to. So the pastor, though, cannot do that, sustain that kind of schedule uh, long. I did for a long time. Mm. I mean, and Sharice would go with me. I would never meet with um, a woman, of course, without Sharice. And she so uh, was so bashful. This is uh, I can tell this because this was thirty years ago, but she would sit behind on the couch, and <laughs> and the person would sit here, and um, and. She would be back there, and if they would say something, she would be mouthing to me, <laughs> tell, tell them this, tell them that, but she wouldn't tell them. And so I don't know why. I, 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 it made me think, though. I remember those early days of the need to have a counsel, counseling um, help and staff or somebody that I could have yes. referred the church people to. That did not exist back then, hmm. it, or if it did, hmm. it was not in our world of um, spirit field or whatever you want to call our churches. You know, it just didn't. Hmm. It was almost seen as unspiritual. Sure. So, sure. Um, how how can we? It, it, let's say you got a church of three, four hundred, five hundred, and it's growing and it's exciting, but people are needing counseling. How can how can let's Let's take it back to you, you're the pastor now, and you know that there's needs and marriages in crisis and families in crisis. How would you build a counseling ministry in a church today? Mm-hmm. Great question. So I would start with educating the congregation, educating on what is mental health, how to identify mental illness. Uh, talking about it in wow. sermons or in messages. How to identify mental illness, even yeah. in your own children even in, or something. Yeah. yeah, and your own self. And so your many children. suicides now, oh, so many addictions. It, so many, yeah. And so needed this connection between mental health and the church. Um, the culture is just getting people. I mean, the culture is just going for our children and and getting and destroying some of them. Gender confusion. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I actually had a very similar situation. Um, Before I went to grad school, I was uh, giving presentations and speeches to young adults on uh, chastity, purity, not high schoolers. I can't play the guitar and do all that, but just my own journey (laughs) and what I came through as, as a young adult. And I had people coming up asking me questions, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm over my head. 
Like, I do not know how to answer some of these things, particularly around gender confusion and all sorts of things. So um, I would say educate yourself, educate your congregation, know when to refer out for that pastor. I think you said it really well. It's not sustainable. You want to meet with them. You want to hear what's going on. Yeah. But the goal of that meeting could be to get you to the right people right. or to set a boundary of I'm going to meet three times maybe, right. you know, so each person gets heard. And I would even say use your accountability and your authority to get them into therapy. You know, I want to know you've called three people or you've met you know, with a couple that you found. Uh, the other thing you can do is um, have... And many times they don't have the finances okay. yeah. either. So I would encourage churches to budget resources uh, for for counseling. I really would. Uh, that is so critical. Yeah. And, you know, it sounds, it sounds so, you know, sure, people would... But no, I didn't in the early years. I had so many other critical things, you know, that just talk to somebody, pray about it, and you'll get better or something. Mm. And, and and I'm not putting that down. I, You know how we believe that. But I do believe that it's, it's almost uh, impossible to have a successful church and not have a counseling uh, ministry. By that, I mean, even if it's a referral. So again, help help me. I'm you, sure. you. How do I build from the bottom up? Uh, yeah. So making sure everyone is aware and uh, kind of getting that buy in to get rid of the stigma. Uh, a lot of um, people in training, getting their training hours. So they've had a degree, but they don't have all the hours for licensing. They don't get paid or don't get paid very much. So it's a very inexpensive way mm. where you could have interns or people on what they call practicum, kind of like a residency that like a medical doctor would do. You could have four or five, six interns and only have to hire the one supervisor, like the one person that's there that's helping them. That would be an inexpensive way. Um, There is certainly government facilities and government uh, department, the uh, Department of Mental Health also provides some low cost. There is um, lay ministers that you can uh, train uh, particularly around identifying mental health. Right. And so if the pastor can't see everyone, then there's um, pastoral counseling. People can get that training. Many times people do that as part of their ministry. Um, I, I think every, as, as I do, every good therapist should give away a percentage of their services. And I try to identify uh, disadvantaged groups in order to do that. But right. um, asking therapists, you know, do you do a sliding scale? Do you have a percentage of that you tithe your services? Uh, those those are always yeah, and I think once you start it, um, it will be you will realize the value that it that and especially if you do it quality. I think that's the key mm-hmm. to just uh, there. Man, if you don't get, I, w- I would be very guarded at who I recommend because if you don't get the right people, uh, that's a serious thing, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you know. Uh, if you don't send people to serious people who are who know what to do and how to handle it, it actually that is sometimes their last uh, reach. Right, and that's so important. So get quality, find quality, and I mean, I know you've mentioned. I know our good friend, Doctor Tim. Uh, Clinton and the and the counselors. I think he. I mm-hmm. think you made reference to them. Nationwide Christian counselors mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. have a great organization, and of course, Doctor Townsend mm-hmm. and you. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know all about your organization or what you do and offer, but talk to us. I'm asking sure. you. You didn't ask for this, and we didn't discuss this, but I trust you. Sure. And uh, where would you where would you lead people uh, concerning? how to build that structure because what will happen is if you can do it successfully it will it will take care of itself i love what you said about there's a lot of government money also mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. now in a lot of insurance uh i know our church ins- uh, insurance here at the church pays for for mental health yes. uh you know counseling for people yeah. who need it and and our deal is let's make sure we give them biblical uh christian you know, counseling. I, I'm very prejudiced about that, I guess, <laughs> because I know it's the best. I'm not saying the other isn't needed, needed, or or we appreciate what they do, but we've got. I'm I'm here, uh, spirit, soul, and body. Right. Pa- the Paul, the Apostle Paul said, "We're spirit, soul, and body," 
And we talk about healing for the body, and we talk about salvation for the spirit, Mm -hmm. but nobody's talking about the mental health and soul. And also, we ought to be budgeting for that, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is part of the care uh, for yourself, part of the care for the congregation. Uh, One of the biggest resources I can mention would be the Townsend Institute at Concordia. take a moment and just tell people how to— connect with that. Sure. We'll put it up under the screen okay. if they're watching the YouTube or whatever, but uh, but those that are just listening in their car. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of uh, looking for a way to build this into your ministry for pastors specifically, uh, would definitely take a look at the Townsend Institute at Concordia University. Lots of resources on how to integrate counseling and mental health into the church. Um, actually, I know uh, Rick, Rick Warren's uh, wife, Kay, yeah. uh, is also doing a big initiative on mental health and the church, and he has resources. Uh, something they lost a son. They lost a son yeah, to suicide, sure. yeah. And uh, another, actually, Dr. Townsend spoke at um, the church the weekend after mm. they had lost their oh, son. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And working with Dr. Townsend, we have something we call the Townsend Leadership Program, yeah. uh, or TLP. You can also there's uh, take a look at that. There's I have an online group where I meet with pastors. I have an in-person group in Atlanta, but there's 20 or 30 of us directors across the country that you can also find online. This is a structured program that is for raising EQ of your pastors, but also showing them how to build in this element of mental health. When I said EQ, sorry, emotional intelligence, mental health and emotional intelligence, building it into their leadership style, building it into their staff, building it into the culture of their ministry and what that would look like for how they would do like a counseling center. So for those who have larger churches and have budgets that are, that are more uh, available, um, even, even, making available to the staff um, counseling and for their marriages. uh, uh, It's time to quit pretending like ministry Mm -hmm. people are totally immune to to any kind of uh, marital diseases or anything else that can get get a hold of their families or lives. Yeah, absolutely. And so I love that. I love what you're saying. So you're saying you already have developed a programs to help. We are already developed a program because a need has been there. To pastor the staff. To pastor the staff, absolutely. And then train the staff uh, then how to pastor, you know, either the volunteers or the people uh, working for them. I'll have all these resources again at my website, drmichellefleming.com. But yeah, it's it's system is out there to step into exactly what people are needing to do. Wanting to do well, uh, I th- I can't thank you enough for um, doing this today, uh, and we appreciate, you know, of course, the impact you've had on our lives and our church. Because if you touch a pastor, you touch that's right everyone that he has been given influence to try to reach, and that's a big deal. And that's why pastors are under attack, as that's you right. know. That's why. So you need your uh, army behind you. A lot of what we talk about at the Townsend Leadership Program, which is where we kind of started talking, was this isolation piece. The mm. other piece is to get pastors together. Mm. So you're in the room really with people that understand and, it and, and through and the church. boy, trenches. you're bringing up something now. We are working <laughs> on that here that we hope that you'll have a big role in. Uh, but we're going to make an announcement next month, next podcast. Oh, wow. About uh, new breaking news on that level of uh, getting pastors together. We we had just uh, just threw a thing out there and said anybody wants to come, especially pastors, uh, and we had to limit it, I think, to maybe 60 couples or something like that because it was the first time we'd ever done it. Mm-hmm. And we just, br- just had them come in and meet, and we hung out for a day and just talked shop and talked uh, raw life, real life. And it was the most touching thing. Mm. These young couples and middle-aged couples and, and elders and whoever was welcome to come. And, and we stopped it at 60. We would have had many, many, many more. But um, it put in my heart and in Marcus's heart a desire to start gathering pastors. Yeah. And we we are we have made a major investment toward that 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 is going to be uh, a work in in action in you know in the very near future. And we're gonna start gathering pastors and their wives 
and pouring into them and bringing in people like yourself, hopefully, that will just really get down beyond the surface of stuff, Mm -hmm. down right where we need to be helped and uh, create us a spirit, soul, and body wholeness uh, atmosphere and place, even retreat, that um, lives can be transformed, hope and faith and love can be restored. So I'm 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 pretty passionate about that because love it. Um, yeah, even Jesus didn't do it alone. Yeah, I mean he could have just risen and just shown up like he did with Paul, right? Yep. But he wanted a group, a team together that he was vulnerable with. You know, That's that he went good. to them when he was weary. He asked them, please stay awake with me for an hour in my anguish. Like he needed mm. others. And so I think that is principled of how we support each other. So good. He, he said to him one time, come apart. Mm. And, 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 and uh, let's, let's, the, he said from the multitudes, come apart and rest yeah. with me. And, they, and they, they went to the Sea of Galilee. You know, they just got away. And uh, I heard old preacher Bob Gass, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he said, if you don't come apart and rest with Jesus, you'll come apart. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. And then after he was gone, they had each other it's very yeah, good. to hold on, you know, restore and talk through things. And you're not meant to do this alone. Yeah, you can't do this alone. The book of Acts is nothing but partnerships. Yeah. It, you never, rarely do you see one guy going out as Paul and Silas, as Peter and John, as mm-hmm. teams, as crews, as mm-hmm. people to, doing it together. And all mm-hmm. the messed up people were in twos too. The, you know, if you read about Paul's enemies, he'd always... Alexander the coppersmith, and, yeah. hmm. you know, yeah. it was, so right relationships matter. Huge. So right. you get connected to the wrong person, it'll take you. Right. And pastors are not uh, exempt from that. That's true. You know, we can find yourself around somebody that just is off and is not healthy. Yeah. And uh, mm. you can end up in a wrong place, That's too. That's a great point. That's the idea of the group, that it's more than one, yeah. right? So if your three other good friends are saying, hey, I think I see a problem here, you know, others can see that. Uh, and w- sometimes when we can't, um, and we, we've gone over, but that's worth talking about. Like, mm. what? Who's your crew? Who? Who yeah. are you? Who are you hanging out with? What? What kind of people? Uh, what? What is their value of marriage? What is their value of family? What is their value of of, of integrity mm-hmm. and character? Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know. Um, can we talk about that a minute? Like, sure. like how, sure. how, how do you, um, that is truly so important that you, like, you have people in your circle, your inner circle. It's not that you just, you, you really have to guard your inner circle and make mm-hmm. sure those people are the people that, that you uh, really listen to. Yeah, absolutely. We, we call that at the Townsend Leadership Program a life team. Mm. And part of the goal of wow. the program like is that. that you form a life team, which is uh, can be four <laughs> to six uh, people that when you call at 3 a.m., you know they're going to pick up the phone. It's people you can be real with. They're not inside your network. They're not tied to your church. They don't have, you're not beholden to them or vice versa in any way. Um, but wow. you can be vulnerable it's with them, really and they can be vulnerable with you. Yeah, Keep really going. important. That is excellent. It's actually also the foundation, which we hadn't mentioned, um, of the twelve-step programs and the groups that are out there. The support for alcohol right. anonymous. There's a, there's emotions anonymous. There's adult children of adult children of alcoholics. There's family members who are living with people that have mental illnesses. Support right. groups. Very good. So one way to bring it in the church would be just to host one of those groups. Sometimes they're just looking for a place to meet. You don't have to do anything, but just be willing to open up the church in the evening and let the people come. And of course, they get to walk through the hall and see everything going on at your church. But that's another way to say, hey, we are open to this. And the support group element is huge, foundational. That's really good. Yeah. That's great. I love that. I love that. Well, I'll let All you right. close us out, Marcus. Well, thank you so much for answering the call. It's awesome. Sure. Thank really, you. We really appreciate it. Hopefully you en- enjoyed this. It helped you. And we'll be doing more in the future on subjects like this. So like, subscribe to Mentoring Moments, maybe comment, send a message to us. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for Mentoring Moments with Jensen Franklin and Marcus Meekham. Leave a comment to join the conversation. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.